other announcements. If you have your Bibles tonight, as uh, mentioned this morning, we will begin a new series in the book of Acts. And we want to consider tonight, tonight chapter 1, first 11 verses. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, which he should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Then he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in, the, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in wild apart. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. We want to consider tonight receiving power. And in the book of Acts, uh, it tells the story of the church of Jesus Christ. Tells of its birth, tells of its development from Jerusalem to Rome. Acts has been called the infant's progress because it traces the history and growth of the baby or the infant church from its inception to Jerusalem. It's a challenging, a thrilling and challenging book because it is the account of real people taking seriously the commandment of Jesus to win others to Christ. <coughs> J.B. Phillips calls it the young church in action. Here is church dynamics at its best. Acts provides many wonderful opportunities for evangelistic preaching to the lost, as well as equipping proclamation to the leaders. Acts could be called the witness book because the word witness appears many times. If you're looking for a key verse in the book of Acts, it would be, of course, uh, Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is coming to you, and ye shall be witnesses both unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts is a book on the move, constantly on the move, a church constantly witnessing. Uh, you have many of the apostles there who are, are uh, uh, preach the gospel and then they're thrown in prison and then they miraculously get out. So it's not a boring book. It is a very uh, active book. We see uh, the purpose of the book. Acts, Acts uh, 1, 1 and 2 teaches us that the ministry of Jesus is to be continued. All that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, Jesus, as we see, the ascension will 
be taking place here in these verses and he will be leaving the earth. But he has made promise of the Holy Spirit which will come to them in Jerusalem in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And uh, we see uh, that uh, Jesus, uh, even though he will ascend to heaven, will be the key person of the book. Now, various titles have been suggested for this book. It's called Acts of the Apostles. Or, I think a good title could be The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because you see the Holy Spirit here in the book of Acts constantly uh, at work. But the key person is the one who is ascending there, and that is Jesus. He is the main actor. He is the main thing. And finally, one should claim the promise of the book. Acts 1, 4, and 5 talks about the promise of the Father. This promise, of course, the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, at Pentecost is instructive today. Now, if you think about these verses, first of all, we see transition to a new era. We see that Jesus is spending these last days, these last 40 days, uh, on the earth teaching his disciples. He is preparing them for the role that they will be taking, and that is the spreading, the establishment, and the spreading of the church that Jesus has died for. We see that he speaks of the kingdom of and the promise spirit. Now many times, and even in, uh, we see there in verse 6, they ask him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? I take that verse to what? I take it uh, in one sense as the apostles not learning their lesson. Because after all, they have seen of Jesus, they know that at least in his first coming, it was not to establish a temporal kingdom on the earth. And so part of me wants to scold. Part of me wants to say, you stupid disciples, after all that you've been through, after the glorious resurrection and everything and the miracles and and everything that Jesus did, and you're still asking, when's he going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel? But, on the other hand, there's something pretty deep there. No, he did not establish the temporal kingdom in the first coming. He, may, he, he has ushered in the kingdom of God into our hearts. The kingdom that he will establish will come during the second coming. So actually they're asking a very prophetic question there. When will you establish your kingdom? And that is yet to come. That will come in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. So the way I look, and you may disagree with me, and that's fine, but I'm just up here rambling. Uh, you know, part, a part of me wants to knock them across the head, and part of me praises them for being so prophetically deep. But anyway, uh, and, but the disciples thought that this meant the end of the world, and even in the, the ministry of Paul, even in Thessalonians there, they thought that the world would end and Jesus would come. But actually, it meant the beginning of a new one the beginning of a new world, the beginning of a new institution, the beginning of the glorious church of Jesus Christ. That is the new transition that is coming, and we shall see here in the book of Acts its birth. You know, we live in a period of transition today. Change is coming very quickly. 
as I said in the message this morning about the information age and so many things rapidly changing. And, uh, you know, this is of concern because with the change of technology and the change in the uh, increase uh, of information, uh, we see an upheaval in ethics. We see today uh, a, a, a morals at their lowest. And like the disciples, we usually take the wrong focus a lot of times. Now secondly, the expectations of a coming kingdom, there as I read in verse 6, his disciples expected an imminent political kingdom. Uh, they still thought, when's Jesus going to set up that political kingdom and restore Israel to its clock, to its apex? Well, it would happen, it will happen, but it'll happen in the second coming. See, that's why the Jews never could accept Jesus of Nazareth in the first coming. He didn't do what they thought he should do. He didn't do what they thought uh, what they thought he would do. But it will happen. And it would fulfill all of the Old Testament predictions. Now Jesus does not deny here uh, the reality of a kingdom, but he moves the focus to their soon to start mission. Now a lot of times we have the wrong focus. Now we're here in the last days, I do believe. And many have tried to set dates. I think of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I think of their founder, and I believe his name was Taz. And about three times he had a group of people to go up on the mountain to sell everything that they had to say that Jesus is coming in such and such a day and such and such an hour. And they'd go up there and guess what? He didn't come. Then he'd have to go back and he would, he would revise his prophetic scheme of prophecy and say, well, I didn't exactly take that into account. Then he'd get to preaching again and he'd get to probably the same group of people on top of the mountain and guess what? Jesus didn't come. And he done it, I believe, the third time. We don't know the exact day or Jesus did not tell us. Why didn't he tell us? Well, he may not have known, given the, um, you know, the limitations of the flesh. God may not have revealed it to him. Or he didn't want to tell us because if we knew the day and time in which he uh, was coming, we may not, you know, be doing the will of God there. It's like Paul. When he was called into the third heaven, saw many of, you know, great and wonderful things unspeakable. The Lord brought him back. He gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep his mouth shut for what he had seen in heaven. Because if he had spoke about what he saw, he wouldn't have had any time to have witnessed. Jesus will come back as he left physically and physically. Now, this, when he comes back to the Mount of Olives, is in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. When he comes to the church, it'll be in the air. Uh, but right now, Jesus is present with us in the Holy Spirit. We don't have his physical presence, but we have the Holy Spirit. Now, thirdly, they were to wait for the power of the Spirit. Notice, if you will, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. So power came at Pentecost, the moment they received the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's always been. He's the third member of the Trinity. He has been from the from even before the beginning. So this is not anything new. This is what I would call a new focus, a new mission here 
of uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. You know, God sends it. It cannot be seen. We, I don't think we can be suddenly slain in the spirit like that. Many of our Pentecostal brethren do. We don't have to wait for it. We get it at salvation. We get it when we're saved. The Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. Well, what happened when the disciples got the spirit? We see there a power of moral change. Especially old Peter. Now he, he messed up pretty bad. He denied Jesus. And he had uh, he spent about half of his life with his foot in his mouth. Have you ever had your foot in your mouth? I have. It's not exactly a wonderful thing. But God, would, uh, Jesus would miraculously forgive him of the denial of he would miraculously forgive him of all the other times that he opened his mouth and he shouldn't have. And then there were some times like at Caesarea Philippi that it was good for him to open his mouth to affirm Christ. But he was uh, recommitted and he would be a wonderful and powerful preacher. He would be the leader of of the apostles. Now, I don't think he was the first pope. I don't accept that. But we see the power of God. There was a certain Hopi Indian's testimony named Emmanuel. He was an alcoholic and a wife beater. And he landed in jail. And he committed, he was saved in jail. When I used to write prisoners years ago, when Homer was here, uh, many, many of them were saved while in prison. I think for a lot of people um, that they have to go to prison or let's say they choose to go and there God has to break them. You know, God uh, God has to be some pretty hard-headed people in the world. Now, I'm hard-headed unless I've never had to go to prison. But God will save many while they were there. And they were given the power to confront the authorities. As we go on in the book of Acts, we see that they were very uneducated men, but were bold in their convictions because they were men of the Spirit. They were unafraid of persecution, and you will see that persecution will be a prevailing theme throughout the book of Acts. Uh, they had the power to testify of God's greatness. When they spoke, their words were convincing. And their lives backed up what they said. These men had been with Jesus. Nothing special about them. No, they weren't the high echelon of society. They weren't the cream of the crop. Nothing special at all. It's just that Jesus knew, with the exception of one, the traitor Judas, that he could make them and teach them. Now, fourthly, we see spiritual power is available, but not automatic. We ask today, where is the Holy Spirit? In Acts, when the Spirit comes, it was obvious to everyone there in the upper room. Came in the form of a rushing and mighty wind, and they began to speak in tongues. But in a lot of ways today, the Spirit seems invisible. Um, have things changed? Or as the problem with us? Do, the, do our Pentecostal brethren have the edge or the corner on the spirit. Well, all Christians uh, have the spirit. Now, Romans 8, uh, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
So all Christians, if you have been born again, have the Spirit of God. Now the problem could be twofold. Some may not be truly saved. Or, a lot of times, some may not be as dedicated as they should be. They may not be as in tune with God as they should be. I'll give you a wonderful illustration. There in a seminary class, um, Herbert Jackson told, as a new missionary, he was assigned a car that would not start without a push. Uh, we've had to push vehicles off before and uh, catch, them, catch them off. Well, after pondering his problem, he devised a plan. He went to the school near his home and got permission to take some children out of class and had them push the old car off. Well, after he made his rounds, he would either park on a hill or leave the engine running. He used this ingenious procedure for two years. Well, finally, ill health forced the Jackson family to leave and a new missionary came to that location. And when Jackson began to explain his arrangement for getting the car started, the new man began to look under the hood. And before the explanation was complete, the new missionary interrupted. Dr. Jackson, I believe the only trouble is this loose cable. And he gave the cable a twist, stepped into the car, pushed the switch, and to Jackson's amazement, the engine roared to life. For two years, he had needless trouble that soon become a routine. The power was there all the time. A loose a simple cable there and the engine. He wouldn't get the power that he needed or the car was. And that's the same way it is with God. Now J.B. Phillips paraphrases Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. How tremendous is the power available to us who believe in God. But we've got to be firmly connected and if we're not, we're only getting part of his power. And many Christians today are probably only operating on four out of eight cylinders. We don't have the full power of the Holy Spirit of God like we should. And when we make firm our connection with God, his life and his power can flow through us. So how do we firm up our connection? Well, get into the Word of God, read it, personally apply it to our lives, pray with discipline, you know, seek out a fellowship with spirit-filled Christians, get involved to service to people, helping people. Spiritual power is unleashed when we give it opportunity. You know, it lies with us. We just got to. We just got to do it. Have you ever uh, went through the junk drawer and you might have found a flashlight that uh, you know hadn't been working? Well, you flip the switch, but nothing, nothing happened. It didn't give. It doesn't give any light. So you unscrew there, the end, took out the batteries and they wouldn't budge. Then you give it a little bang and then they fall out and ugh, they're corroded. You ever had corroded batteries and flashlight? I'm sure we all have. Well, finally, after some effort, they come loose. It's a mess, you know, battery acid all over the place. The batteries were new when you put them in there. And then, and you know, you store it in a safe, warm place, but that's the problem. Those batteries weren't made to be warm and comfortable. 
And it's the same with Christians. We were, be, we were made to be turned on, to put our love to work, to apply our patience in difficult, trying situations, to let our light shine. And then finally, uh, number six, power to be witnesses. Again, back to verse eight, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. The main duty of Christians is to witness, not just telling people about Jesus, we should, but living like Christians. Living to the best of our ability with the Spirit's help. The Christian life. Now, not everyone is an evangelist. We don't all uh, have probably the same gifts, the same spiritual gifts of, of uh, witnessing and telling people. But we do have a testimony if we've been saved. You may say, well, I don't know all that witnessing jargon or all the scripture. And, well, that's fine if you don't. Just tell what Jesus did for you. I remember several years ago with Homer. Here. He had a witness, witnessing class. And he made us write out our testimonies. Just tell what Jesus has done for you. And uh, you don't have to know a lot of, you know, witnessing techniques. Just let the power of the Spirit come from there. C.S. Lewis said, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it is irresistible. If even 10% of the world's population had it, the whole world would be converted and happy before a year's end. Well, as it says there in verse 8, witness from the inner circle out there, uh, beginning... Uh, there in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, that's where the early church started. Went there into the uttermost parts of the earth. We begin with our family. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of times that's the most difficult. But we begin there, and then our neighborhood. Then we go into the world, different cultures. So tonight, as we begin the book of Acts, we see. Uh, they were receiving power uh, there. I'm looking forward to this uh, preaching series.